My name is Benjamin Selinski, and I actually have one of the coolest jobs in Qatar. You may not know it, but I do. Uh, I build robots. I fly airships. I reach out to kids, and we solve problems. We make inventions. I play with Legos. Sometimes I actually just get to be a mad scientist for a little while. This is actually my job. This is what I do. I'm the program outreach manager at Texas A&M University at Cutter. My job is to reach out and I engage kids and students in fun problem solving and creative engineering. And I actually really do love my job. Because my job is to inspire kids. What we do is we try to reach out to them so they can study the STEM fields, science, technology, ed, uh, engineering, and mathematics. We want them to create and build and try new things. But if, I, if my job is to inspire children, I'm going to ask the question is, what is it that actually inspired me to study STEM? Well, funny enough, it really started when I was young, really young, in fact. Um, growing up, when I was a kid, we had something called career days in school. I don't know if we actually do them anymore. But you would show up, and parents would show up at school, and they would talk about what they did for a living. Um, and students were invited to come and come dressed up as what they were going to be when they grow up. And so we had little doctors and little teachers and little professional athletes. Every so often, there was like a little Batman, because that kid had a dream. And that's what we did. But for me, growing up, I always, always knew what I was going to be. I always came to school dressed as a scientist, because scientists had the answers. What scientists did was they knew all the answers, all the problems, and the questions that I had. No matter what it was, how old were the pyramids, or how deep is the ocean, how many moons does Saturn have, it didn't matter. Scientists knew the answers. To me, they were the smartest people in the room, always. I wanted to be one of those scientists. Now, when people ask me, why did I become a scientist, I always like to say, because I look so good in a lab coat, which is true, obviously. But really, what else could I do? Now, how did I actually learn about becoming a scientist? We didn't have scientists in my household. My parents weren't. How did I learn about this? Strangely enough, back in the early 1970s, 1980s or so when I was a kid, the only place where you actually saw science for me was on television. That's what we did. Because right then, at that, at that time in the United States, educational programming was booming on TV. We all watched, say, The Electric Company and Sesame Street. They taught us about the alphabet and learning and fractions and our numbers and sharing and friendship. Later on, they did actually true shows based just to educate kids on science and engineering, but we didn't even know it at the time. One of my favorites, well, before we get to that, they actually showed things, all these incredible scientific accomplishments were on TV at the time. I watched the space shuttle in 1981 take off and land for the very first time. Every little kid at that point wanted to be an astronaut. We saw all the discoveries by Jacques Cousteau as he took people down in bathyscaps to the bottom of the ocean depths. Every kid wanted to take scuba lessons. That's what we did. Later on, TV shows right at the start of the computer age, of the home computer age, started to show up. Shows like 3 to one Contact. Now, besides having the best theme song in the history of television, which I thankfully will not sing for you now, these were young kids who showed up every week. And what did they do? They ask questions about the world around them. They had questions that I actually had. Then they went on adventures, and they found scientists, and they found the answers to them. Questions like, how do bees communicate? Or how do physicists figure out how to throw the perfect fastball? Every week, they had the Bloodhound Gang. Listen to this. Teenagers working as private detectives solving mysteries with what? Science. I wanted to do this so bad. I just wanted to be that group doing this sort of stuff. Later on, we had someone called Mr. Wizards. He would pop into our living rooms every day. This nice, kindly old man would show up, and he would have a young assistant. He would ask them simple questions about the world that maybe you never thought about. Do you know why a drinking straw works the way it does? Have you ever seen a liquid boil at room temperature? And then they would do experiments, not in a laboratory or somewhere, but in a kitchen setting. They would do experiments, and they would encourage you to try to do this at home. And I did these experiments. He answered a lot of questions for me. But I built things because of this. I built balloon rocket ships, and I made types of styrofoam, and I crushed soda cans with just air pressure. In fact, I built a series of homemade barometers, because every kid needs to know when the next cold front is coming. But these are the people I saw that inspired me, and I loved it. 
And later on, I became a professional scientist. I became a chemist. And I, learned, I did these skills for about 10 years. I was invited here to teach young engineers some of the skills that I had learned. Now, these were young engineering students, and I was expecting them to have the same sort of stories where they tell me how they built their first PC like I did. How they built their first PC like I did, or how they took apart a moped engine to learn how it works, because I did those things. But I didn't actually see that from my original students. They, were, they didn't have those hands-on skills, the things that they had developed. They never did experiments at home like I did. And I was questioning why not. And it turns out a lot of other people were questioning this as well. Smart, brilliant kids, but they never actually got their hands dirty. And other people saw this as well. In the early 2000s, a group of like-minded individuals, professional scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs and inventors, they came together and they said, you know what? We want to actually go ahead and teach the next generation about building and using your hands and doing stuff of their own. They started small communities and there was a group of friends who got together. Then they started putting it on the internet and news groups and chat rooms and online communities. And later on it became the maker movement. They had fairs and magazines and things like this. But then later on it actually, once again, moved over to television. In the early 2000s, we had shows like Scrap Heap Challenge, where everyone could build anything you wanted out of junk. Robot Wars and BattleBots took a niche robot building community and said you could build fantastical machines on your kitchen table. And then of course we have the gold standard of Mythbusters, where everyone could look at the world around them, ask questions, and sort of defy preconceived notions with science and experimentation. And I love this stuff. But later on, actually, this morphed into actually the YouTube and the social media channels that we see nowadays. Channels like Physics Girl, Number File, Smarter Every Day. Hundreds of millions of YouTube channels of these people watch this stuff and they learn new ideas, new thoughts, simple engineering experiments that once again, you can do at home. Uh, if y'all don't believe me or if you've never seen these particular ones, ask your kids or your little brothers and sisters if they ever watched a YouTube video about making slime. Because I guarantee you they have. We're talking, yeah, I'm seeing heads nod. Hundreds of thousands of these videos with hundreds of millions of views. And really, it's just a chemistry lesson. But the question is, is does watching these videos or these things, does it actually inspire people to get hands on? Does it inspire them to actually do something? Or are they just being entertained, learning a new skill, and then moving on? Does it actually even matter? Well, it does to me. And it does to a lot of other STEM professionals. So, because what we honestly believe is that you actually need to get your hands dirty. You need to build, you need to be surrounded by, you need to try to do things by yourself or with others as a community. You need to really get into the dirt and try things. And that's what we do at Texas A&M University at Cutter. We actually go out to the schools and we bring this stuff to them. We have our science and engineering roadshow. Over the past year and a half, we visited over 10,000 kids where we bring my, quote, magic show. It's not magic, it's science and engineering. I always tell my students that. But we bring fun and exciting activities to the students where they get to play and get hands on with it. We get them right into their face. We bring volunteers up. The kids are entertained and they learn stuff. And we sneakily throw in lessons on fluid dynamics and polymer chemistry and kinetics. And even though every kid may not walk out of there knowing all of these topics, they do one thing. When we ask the teachers and the administrators, are they talking about it? They say, absolutely yes. The kids talk about the show days and weeks later, and they're asking the questions we want them to ask. How did they do that, and can we try it? And that's what we want them to do. And these are the things that sort of inspire me. We also do other programs at our school. We bring in kids uh, for a week to two week long camps where they do creative engineering to solve real world problems. Just recently, we had a camp where kids came in for a few days and they built model hovercraft. But the whole time, they learned about engineering cost and thrust and radio controls and 3D printing and design and testing. It was a brilliant, and they built these little tiny hovercrafts that could skip along the water or the pond of our classrooms. But on the last day, we took these 30 kids and we gave them a brand new challenge. We said, now build us a full-size hovercraft. Build us a hovercraft that can carry a member of your team and then we stepped back and watched. And you've never seen 30 kids who just get that sort of glazed stare at first, and then they go, yeah, we can build this. We've got a little bit of time. We know some things. We know how to use the tools. We can now test our materials. We know what to do. And they did. And within an hour or so, 
I had about eight of these crafts zipping all around our building. They had a lot of fun with that one. But it's interesting because this hands-on making, this hands-on building has actually changed how we teach STEM education, not just in Qatar but around the world. In Qatar, there's actually dedicated STEM schools that are being developed and are, some are actually running right now. Almost every school here has STEM education platforms and funding for it. And it's an amazing thing because it's really what we're shooting for. It's what we want to happen. But here's the next question for you. Why does it matter? Why does, it, why does anyone actually care that we have these programs available? Texas A&M has a STEM hub where people come in and actually build and develop and prototype their own skills. There's one right here in the Qatar National Library. But why do we care? Why is Qatar so invested in this? Because in three generations, Qatar went from a small desert nomadic country to one of the wealthiest and most influential countries in the world. And with that kind of growth comes problems of its own. Just recently, Qatar uh, reserved vast tracts of land for agricultural use, but standard farming techniques don't work in the desert. Who here is gonna develop the new technology to make those, that farmland arable? Who here is gonna develop the new techniques to secure the food and the water of a country for generations to come? And that's what STEM education professionals like me, that's what we're here to, dear, here to do. We're here to inspire the next generation. We're here to try and get them to learn their problem-solving skills, to develop the tools, to be able to use their hands and try and make things of their own. And we're, we think we're doing it, at least we hope so. But it's interesting because this is what inspiration is. But one of the problems with this is that inspiration, it's really not enough. Now that's what I do, I inspire kids, that's what I tell people, that's my job. But really, you need more than that. Inspiration is the spark. Inspiration is just that little spark that you give kids so they can try and do new things. Hopefully what we actually do is we empower kids. Because if you empower someone, if you empower a student, you give them strength and confidence. If you empower a kid, hopefully they'll be able to raise their hand in the classroom and ask the tougher questions that they need to know. If you empower a student, you give them the persistence to try and fail and try again no matter what happens, no matter what the adversity. And that's what we like to do. Now, I've used the term inspire a lot in this talk, and I know this, but it's what I just need to do. And one of the things here is that when building these programs, I've learned some hard lessons actually about myself. Um, I just wanted to be a scientist. That's all I ever wanted to do. I wanted to be someone who answered the tough questions, who could solve the problems. I wanted to be someone who you could come to and says, yeah, Ben's one of the smart guys in the room. And although it pains me to say this, I'm not the guy who knows all the answers. I'm, unfortunately, no one really is. But I still get to keep trying. I still get to brainstorm and come up with new ideas. In, de in developing these programs and these skills and these roadshows, I get to learn new things. I have had to hit the books again and the forums again. Yes, I have been that kid watching the YouTube videos learning how to make better slime. I promise you I have. That's the fun part about it. I get to keep learning. I get to keep experimenting. And hopefully, at the end of the day, I can still try and be one of the smart people in the rooms. And I hope after today, you're empowered to try the same. Thank you very much.